Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Last time, we followed the Corsican privateers Juan and Blas Miguel Corso while they hunted and attacked French and English pirates in the West Indies. Now, they certainly didn't isolate their attacks to pirates and privateers. In fact, most of their raids were against merchants and fishermen and the like. Still, though, as far as their commissions were concerned, they were to act as coast guard, patrolling Spanish waters for smugglers and pirates. And they really took to the job, hunting Lutheran corsairs. Still, one pirate in particular vexed them, Lorho de Graaf. He was the greatest corsair of his age, and he would not be caught. In fact, quite the opposite. He actively hunted the Corso brothers in return, lurking in the waters south of Cuba that they called home. He tried to draw them out with his own raiding. He captured ships and killed their crews. He plundered them. He burned them. De Groff really wanted the Corso brothers, likely in a quest for revenge after they raided his home at Cap Francais. Still, they wouldn't be caught. They were also skilled privateers and talented sailors. They knew how men like Lorho de Groff operated. It wasn't until a Biscayan privateer, Capitan Fermin Salaveri, stumbled across Lorho de Groff that the Dutch rover had his chance at the Corsos. After a fierce battle, in the end, Lorho de Graaf killed Juan Corso, and Blas Miguel vowed revenge. Now, that entire battle was illegal, at least on the face of things. The governors at both Havana and Petit Guave might protect their privateers, but it was still outright piracy. They were in a time of peace, and these were very much wartime maneuvers. See, battles at sea for revenge between warring bands of pirates that ended with hundreds of men dead and both sides vowing to hunt down and exact revenge on the others, well, that might be a relatively everyday affair in the West Indies. Now, to the pirates involved, it was certainly high drama. It was a literally life-and-death struggle over questions of honor and retribution. But from a different point of view, from the outlook of, say, the Lords of Trade or the Council of the Indies, it was almost mundane. Even to the governors that had to personally deal with warring pirates, it was really little more than a distraction. It was a distraction that oftentimes saw them hauled back to Europe to stand trial, but it was still less important than assuring commerce flourished, and that the smooth flow of slaves and sugar was not interrupted. Now, in the normal course of things, the governors in Port Royal, Petit Guave, or Havana might send out a royal ship to chase off the pirates, maybe make a few arrests to show just how tough they were on piracy, but really that was even rarely a priority. Imagine the teachers at some school seeing two groups of boys roughing each other up on the schoolyard. It was a problem, and one that needed to be solved, but it wasn't too tough to deal with, usually just a sigh and a show of authority. But just now, after this little battle, the governors of Havana and Petit Guave, and even in Port Royal, well, they would have been deeply annoyed at the reports of de Graaf and the Corso brothers fighting. Now, it wasn't the fighting itself, that's why the privateers were kept around in the first place, but those governors were under orders. They were to avoid fighting, if at all possible. They were to gather strength to them, not send it out to do battle and get killed. See, things in the West Indies, and even more so back in Europe, well, they were tense. Armies were on the move, as well as navies. But they were being careful not to engage one another. There was lots of posturing, lots of shows of strength, but no real fighting yet. But in the West Indies, where tempers were known to flare without warning, and ships crewed by barely civilized freebooters crossed paths on a daily basis that tension could erupt much more quickly into outright war. And if, say, a Dutch privateer flying French colors killed a bunch of Spanish sailors, well, that could be the event that sparked real conflict, not just in the West Indies, but across the world. It might be just the excuse Spain and the Habsburg Empire needed to enter French territory and to retake Strasbourg or Luxembourg. Now, it didn't happen right there, but it very likely could have. Either that, or maybe Spain would sail in and bombard Petit Guave or Tortuga until they finally capitulated. Then they could reclaim that city and maybe the whole of San Dominique for Spain. In Europe, though, everyone knew exactly where the battle lines were drawn. 
They knew that there were lines not to cross unless you meant to do battle. However, in America, conflict could erupt anywhere, at any time, for almost any reason. So I ask you, does that sound like a good environment in which to raise a child? I assume that most of you would say no. It seems like if you had a small child to care for, the logical answer would be to avoid a place like that. And that's exactly what Anne LeLong thought. If her husband, Pierre, were still alive, and some records indicate that he was, he likely would have counseled her to stay in Brittany with Marie Marguerite Yvonne. She was only a few months old still, and the West Indies might be a dangerous place for a newborn. The point is, Anne did elect to stay in Brittany, for the time being at least, and it was probably a smart move. Things were about to get very dangerous back in the West Indies. This is episode 58, Fall of Titans. With the war threatening to break out at any moment and tensions running high, it would be best for everyone to just go home and cool off and relax, especially when someone had, say, personally vowed revenge for the death of their brother at the hands of Lorenzo. That might be a good time to try some breathing exercises or a nice cup of tea. But that's not what Blas Miguel Corso did. Instead, he rallied his strength and sailed on Petit Guave on the 10th of August, 1687. Now, this date serves two very deliberate purposes. First, it was a feast day, and the residents of Petit Guave would likely be caught off guard and lightly defended. It was tactically a good move. But, and I just cannot believe this is an accident, it was the feast day of St. Lawrence. If your brother had been killed by a man named Lorenzo, or Lorenzo for little Lawrence, and you had the opportunity to invade his hometown, kill his friends, attack his neighbors, and possibly even take the man himself on a feast day that shares his name, well, wouldn't you take that opportunity? You would have to be blind not to see the poetry in that. But more to the point, St. Lawrence is a saint because he was martyred on the 10th of August. Now, Blas Miguel Corso probably didn't want to see de Graff martyred and sainted, but that really wasn't an option for a man like de Graff. However, he absolutely wanted to see Lorenzo executed like his namesake. So Blas Miguel led 85 privateers ashore to hunt down Lorho de Graff and do any mischief that they could along the way. And he would find Lorho de Graff. Unfortunately, he would find him at the head of several hundred other pirates, buccaneers, and guardsmen. The 85 put up a fight, but they were surrounded and captured almost immediately. Then de Graff led his men down to the shore, where the ships of Blas Miguel and his compatriots were waiting. The pirates trekked out into the surf, and Lorho de Graff personally killed the man leading the guards. Then Lord Hodegraaf took the boats out to those Spanish vessels and captured the officers on board, as well as the ships. A few days later, Blas Miguel Corso, along with a few other of the ranking officers, were brought into the town square at Petit Guave and broken on the wheel. All of that tension that was building in the West Indies was... Well, it acted like chum to a shark. It was calling the pirates and privateers out of the woodwork, now the Spanish, and really the English as well, were busy hunting pirates anywhere they could be found. Spain would mount a third and unsuccessful attempt to find La Salle's French colony in the Gulf of Mexico. But pirate hunting was slow going. Most buccaneers, with any sense at all, were far from the Caribbean. But they could tell with every piece of news they received that war was imminent. And that meant work. And good government contracts, too. They might get fresh provisions, or new guns, or, if they were lucky, even a new ship. Privateers were swarming into the West Indies, from La Salle's colony and the North American colonies and even the coast of Africa. The promise of war made them bold. Perhaps the most prominent of these was Jan Willems, who left the swamps of Carolina and approached the English on Jamaica in September 1687. He had, quote, a large Dutch-built ship with 44 guns and 100 men. Jacob Evertson has a fine bark with 10 guns, 16 swivel guns, and about 50 men. They also have a small sloop, end quote. Willems anchored off the north coast of Jamaica in Montego Bay, 
and he smuggled word ashore that he was open to accepting an English commission. Now, he might have had news that Christopher Monk, the Duke of Albemarle, was somewhat more lenient than Molesworth had been towards privateers. Unfortunately for him, Molesworth was still actually in charge of dealing with privateers. He wrote of Jan Willems, quote, that if he was ready to come in and live honestly among us, giving security for the same, he might be received, end quote. That is to say, if he was willing to come to Jamaica and live an honest life, but not the life of a privateer. Still, though, it was better than nothing, and certainly better than arrest, so Willems and Evertson wrote a letter. Quote, Captains Yankee and Jacob to Lieutenant Governor Molesworth, Montego Bay, 3 September 1687. We have arrived from Carolina and brought several people thence who have been driven from the colony by the trouble with the Spaniards. In all sincerity, we present ourselves, our ships, and company to the service of the King of England, and hope for your assurance that our ships and men shall not be troubled or molested, as we are ignorant of the laws and customs of this island. We can satisfy you that we have never injured any British subject. Signed, John Williams and Jacob Everson. End quote. That sounds nice, doesn't it? But that last bit there about never having injured any British subject... Well, there's actually two things to note about that. First, it's an interesting choice of words to use British subject. See, the Kingdom of Great Britain didn't yet exist. It wouldn't exist for another almost exactly 20 years. However, it was well known that the Stuarts, and especially James II, was invested in the idea of uniting Scotland and England. Perhaps Jan Willems was stroking their ego a bit, and also pointing out that he hadn't injured any Scottish citizens as well as English. That was, of course, though, complete nonsense. Jan Willems was still a fugitive from English law and a wanted man in every English colony from New York to Barbados. Three years earlier, he'd captured the James, an English trader, and he'd imprisoned the crew. He brought them back to Petit Guave, where they were released, but the James was impounded by France. Remember when HMS Ruby sailed for Saint-Dominique, intending to arrest Jan Willems? That was all about his capture of the James, and England hadn't just forgotten about that. So Lieutenant Governor Moldsworth ordered the frigate HMS Falcon, under Captain Charles Talbot, to sail around the island and arrest Jan Willems. Unfortunately, the Falcon wasn't up to the task. She was forced to return home before reaching Williams, because she was in such poor repair. Instead, Molesworth sent out a letter on a smaller vessel, offering the pirates pardon and naturalization if they agreed to buy property, renounce privateering, and give up their vessels. Willems and Evertson replied that giving up privateering would leave them, quote, destitute of all livelihood in present and future, end quote, and that they didn't have, quote, money to purchase an estate ashore. Still, that was the offer that Molesworth was willing to make, and he wasn't prepared to sweeten the deal. On 19 October, he wrote, quote, If you will accept the condition, make the best of your way to Port Royal. If not, leave the coast at once, for I shall consider the treaty to be at an end. End quote. Jan Willems and Jacob Evertson left the coast at once. The same month that Jan Willems arrived off Jamaica's coast, well, September 1687 was a busy month. Back in Europe, even though the war hadn't officially begun, France and the Holy Roman Empire were both moving their armies into position. They were grabbing up territory that was of questionable ownership. You know how when you're about to play a game of Risk before the game begins, you have to place all your pieces strategically? That was happening. They were doing that in the West Indies as well. Governor Pierre-Paul de Cousset of Saint-Dominique had orders for the pirate Lorho de Graaf. He had to be reined in, brought in from the cold, as it were, and the governor had just the job for the task. Ilavache, or Ilavaca, or in English, Cow Island, lay just off the southern coast of Saint-Dominique. It was still technically part of Santo Domingo, Spanish territory, but at the time it was mostly Englishmen that used the island. Now, the island had a rich history of harboring pirates, all the way back to Henry Morgan, and even well beyond that. But right now, its ownership was up in the air. It was a strategically important position, an island stronghold that 
any of the three powers might utilize if a war should break out. But that was only one part of the reason for the interest in the island. You see, there was treasure nearby. And not just any treasure. A wrecked Spanish treasure galleon had just been found. The English on Ilavake were actually there looking for the treasure, but France found the wreck first off the coast of Haiti, not too far off. No, I've got a whole episode in the works about the wreckers and the treasure hunting going on here and elsewhere in the Caribbean at the moment, so I'm going to more or less brush by this, but I will say that Governor de Cousset sent de Graff to secure Ilavache and also the treasure. He was able to do so pretty easily. See, England didn't even bother to put up a fight, even though they were really interested in finding that treasure. It was, well, it was easy because everyone was lying. The French said they needed the island for defense against Spain and that England had to vacate. England responded that they wouldn't stop the French from defending the island. They'd even help out if only they could stick around. See, they uh, fished there. That's it. They used it for fishing. I guess there wasn't much good fishing around Jamaica. So France replied, yeah, sure. Look, if England stayed, it would be against the terms of their neutrality pact. And in Jamaica, the Duke admitted, quote, Few of our ships do fish there, and then, not for the edible turtle, but for the tortoise shell. And, as to hunting, the thing is unknown. So, I issued a proclamation ordering compliance with Monsieur de Cusset's request. End quote. There was actually a political motivation for de Cusset ordering de Graaf to Ilavache, beyond the obvious military and economic benefits. See, at that moment... Santo Domingo had a delegation in Petit Guave. They were there to discuss terms of a treaty that would ensure a lasting peace and deal with the privateer problem. De Cusset was able to report that he was just about to send Lorho de Graff out on an absolutely peaceful mission, one that would keep him out of the Spaniard's hair and absolutely didn't involve salvaging millions in lost Spanish silver. Later, he would write, quote, one cannot describe the joy these Spaniards felt when they learned, said Monsieur Lorho, would cease making war on them. And he went on, they could not cease staring at him, being unable to believe he was made like other men. End quote. So Lorho de Graff sailed to Ila Vache with 250 men and took possession of the island. He had regular patrols out guarding the reclamation efforts on the treasure galleon, but he was also looking for any trouble that Spain might be sending their way. It was, on the whole, dull work, but it kept him busy. Meanwhile, Jan Willems was less gainfully employed. Without a commission, and without much in the way of money or food, they were forced to turn to old-fashioned roving. And they had a lead. Their own treasure galleon, in fact. In February, Governor Albemarle received word that the pirates had engaged a treasure ship. He writes, quote, the pirates Jan and Jacobs have fallen upon a great Spanish ship in the Bay of Honduras called the Hulk. If Jan failed in this attempt, he is ruined, for it is said that he was very ill provided before. Had I the honor of pardoning pirates, which was formerly usual here, I could have done the king good service. End quote. When Albemarle calls that ship the Hulk, He's saying in English it was the Urca. Now, probably not the Urca de Lima, since this ship was out of Spain and not Peru, but possibly. He's also regretting Jan Willems wasn't in the service of England. Had he the power to grant Willems a commission, as English governors had formerly possessed, England would have a strong, capable, experienced captain on their side. It was something of a passive-aggressive note to the Lords of Trade and King James, that he really should be given that authority, especially since things were so, so clearly marching toward war. A few weeks later, he received further word of Jan Willems. As it happened, Willems had taken the Urca. It was a fierce firefight lasting from dawn until three in the afternoon, but the pirates were successful in the end, and they sailed away with the Urca and all of her rich treasure. This was arguably one of the greatest hauls ever taken at sea. It rivals the later prizes taken by Henry Avery and Bartholomew Roberts and Sam Bellamy, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions, in silver and gold and gems, in indigo and pearls and elephant hides and ivory. 
Right now, for Jan Willems and Jacob Evertsen, it was a good time to leave the West Indies. They would be rich men, and they could make it anywhere with a haul like that. However, neither would live to enjoy their newfound wealth. They disappeared somewhere in the Atlantic, traveling to the North American English colonies. Their ships made it just fine, along with their crews and all that fabulous treasure, but neither captain arrived with them. We don't know what happened to Jan Willems or Jacob Evertsen. Perhaps they were killed in the battle with the Urca in Honduras Bay, or perhaps they succumbed to injuries taken in the fighting, or to illness at sea. Many historians have suggested that with the two captains about to receive such a large sum with their shares from this fabulous haul, the crews decided to mutiny and kill them both. Their shares divided among a few hundred other men might not be much, but maybe it was enough to kill over. Or it's possible that the crew disagreed with their plans after taking the Urca. Both pirates were marked men, and their options for a place to settle down and spend that windfall were limited. Perhaps they were deposed, maybe even put ashore on some lonely island, while the crew sailed away to happier harbors, places that would not have accepted either Jan Willems or Jacob Evertsen. What we do know is that a ship arrived some months later in Newport, Rhode Island. It was commanded by a man named Captain George Peterson. Now, we'll talk more about Peterson when we talk about the pirates of the New England coast, but for now, Captain Peterson arrived in Newport at the head of a crew made up of men who had formerly served with John Hamlin, Jacob Evertson, and Jan Willems. He informed the authorities that all three men were now dead. In March, the Spanish would undertake yet another failed mission to find La Salle's colony. You see, here's the problem. Have you ever lost your keys and searched everywhere they should be extremely carefully? The couch cushions, the car, your purse, your jacket, the counter right next to the door, your pants pockets, the couch cushions again, that chair you never sit in, but you never know, the jacket again, pockets again until finally you're sitting in your car after having searched every inch of it and still no sign of your keys. It's maddening. Well, that's what the Spanish were doing. La Salle's colony is supposed to be at the mouth of the Mississippi River. That's why it was there in the first place. But the mouth of the Mississippi is an unbelievably complex maze of islands. It's made of lakes and inlets and endlessly branching tributaries. The Spanish were busy mapping the region, and in fact would create the first truly reliable maps of the region. It was all in the service, though, of finding La Salle's colony, and the pirates that lived there. They searched Barataria Bay, which eventually will play a much larger role in our story. They searched Lake Salvador, and then back to Barataria Bay, and into any of the many, many lakes and watersheds with Cajun names that I will not utter here. But... When you're searching for your keys and you've given up hope of ever finding them and beginning to seriously consider purchasing a bus pass, miraculously, there they are. Somewhere that they have no logical right to be. Maybe the freezer or the shower. You haven't taken a shower since you got home, but there they are. Personally, I tend to put keys up high, out of sight, as soon as I walk through the door. The point is, the keys were somewhere that there was no right for them to be. It doesn't make any sense. Well, that was the case with La Salle's colony. It was much too far to the west to be of any use in exploring the Mississippi, but because it was so far out there in a place it had no logical right to be, the Spanish just never looked there. Still, even if they were unsuccessful, those Biscayan privateers were busy wreaking havoc across the region. On March 21st, 1688, Governor Edwin Steed of Barbados would write that the English ship Dragon, under Captain Roger Whitfield, had been taken by José de Leoz y Ecolar. The Dragon had fallen, quote, into the hands of the Biscayners about Puerto Rico, who are taken into the King of Spain's service to take pirates, and who interrupt English traders more than the pirates ever did. They not only confiscate the ship and goods, but put all men to death. End quote. The Biscayners were a menace, no more so than the Brethren of the Coast had been. In fact, really quite a bit less so. They weren't marching on Port Royal or burning Petiquav to the ground. Well, Blas Miguel had tried to do so, but 85 men is nothing compared to the 2,000 under Henry Morgan. 
But they were still a menace, however, a menace that the Spanish were willing to tolerate. After all, when war came, and it was coming, they would be eminently useful tools. So Jan Willems and Jacob Evertsen were dead, along with Mikhail André Zun and, right about this time, Michel de Grammont. The Corso brothers were both dead, and though the Biscayners were causing trouble, it would probably mean war if anyone tried to do anything serious about it, so Lorho de Graff was busy minding Ila Vache for the moment. Things in the world of West Indian piracy had settled down a bit. Back in Europe, though, the war against the Ottomans and all of the tertiary conflicts, well, they were all finally wrapped up. Several thousand soldiers and commanders of the Habsburg forces in Europe, all of whom were now veterans of the war, were now marching west to the Rhine. Louis XIV was marching out to meet them with armies of his own. It was clear that things were at a head, and if war was to be averted, it had to be now. However, to all those regular people living in Europe, it seemed like a good time to get out while the getting was good. That might have been on Anne's mind when she chose to sail west across the Atlantic for Saint-Dominique. Although, honestly, I kind of doubt it. She left her daughter there in Brittany with family, and that doesn't seem like the action of someone running for safety. More likely, she finally received word of her husband's death. The funeral rites would already have been handled there in Petiguave, but Anne had respects to pay, and she also had more pressing real-world concerns. Pierre Lelong was a landed man. He had ships and slaves and a whole plantation to his name. There was also something of a manor house there, not the grand 19th century colonial manor you might be picturing, but no slouch either. Anne had to go deal with all of that stuff, though. Much of it was likely left to her, if not all of it, and even if it wasn't left to her, it would still be her responsibility to handle it. At some point in late 1688 or 1689, and returned to Cap Francais. And then at some point over the next year or so, she remarried. It wasn't really in question whether or not she would marry. The Queen of England might choose not to marry, but a French woman in her 20s with land and property to her name, I mean, women weren't even really allowed to own property at the time. She was really sort of a caretaker, or maybe better described as an executor, of Pierre Lelong's estate, but she would be expected to remarry. She chose to marry a man named Joseph Chirel. He was almost certainly someone she already knew, probably someone that knew Pierre Lelong as well. I think it's important to note here that the idea of the institution of marriage as a loving relationship is a relatively recent one. It was much more of a financial concern back then, a business arrangement, really. A woman in Anne's position would likely have a fair amount of say in the matter, but she probably would have chosen someone capable of running that plantation, arguably somebody who even knew the grounds already. As for love and companionship and even sex, people often looked outside the marriage, especially the French. Mistresses were common for French husbands, and oftentimes wives turned to other married women for emotional support and sexual fulfillment, and even that sense of partnership. A best friend was far better suited to that task than some man you signed a contract with to run your plantation and give you children. And now Anne, who now was Anne Shirell, would have had success there as well. The plantation was back up and running. They were earning money again, and once again she became pregnant. And those months, that year or so after Jan Willems died, were relatively slow. Anne was putting her life back together, and Lorho de Graff was busy manning an empty island. But back in Port Royal, a titan was falling. The Duke of Albemarle had convinced King James to reinstate Sir Henry Morgan to the Council of Jamaica. However, it was more of an honorary gesture. Henry Morgan was, by this point, too ill to attend any meetings. He'd been drinking heavily for many years, and ever since he'd been removed from power and growing in wealth, well, there was no check on his baser instincts. Albemarle had his personal physician, Hans Sloan, attend Morgan, and he found that Morgan was, quote, lean, sallow-colored, his eyes a little yellowish and belly jutting out or prominent. He complained to me of want of appetite for victuals. He had a kicking to vomit every morning, and generally a small looseness attending him. 
and withal as much given to drinking and sitting up late, which I supposed had been the cause of his present indisposition. End quote. Sloan diagnosed Morgan with dropsy, and ordered Morgan to quit drinking immediately and put him on a healthier diet. But Morgan didn't listen to that. He died on August 25th, 1688. He was, as best as we can guess, 53 years old. That's actually a pretty long life for someone who started out as a buccaneer. He had a good name, he had familial connections, but in many ways Morgan was a self-made man. Now, his pursuits were less than honorable, plunder and murder and slave labor, but in 1688 those were things to be respected. Governor Albemarle ordered him buried with full state honors and had every ship in the harbor fire off a salute. It's been said that the governor ordered an amnesty so that all the pirates and privateers in the West Indies could attend, but I find that pretty doubtful. Morgan hadn't been himself a pirate or privateer in years, and he devoted no small amount of his energy in those last years to actively hunting, prosecuting, and executing pirates. That might be a bit of romance, but it does paint a powerful picture. Henry Morgan left no children. His fortune and his property were all left to his brother-in-law and his sister. And then just over one month later, on the 6th of October, 1688, Governor Christopher Monk, Duke of Albemarle, followed Morgan into the grave. Now, he was only 35 years old and in fine health up until a sudden death. The loss of both men, though, the governor and Henry Morgan himself, well, that shook Jamaica to the core. It sent shockwaves through the colony. It rippled out to all the other English settlements in the West Indies. And it should be noted that back in England, things were crumbling as well, but we'll talk about that later. Meanwhile, the salvage operation under Lower Haut de Graaf had concluded. Apparently, it went well, because in early 1689, he was ordered out to another salvage job. Now, that might seem kind of dull for a man like de Graaf. But salvaging actually proved to be far better work than privateering. It was safer, obviously, and it also paid better. But really, what's probably the most important to a crew is that, well, they didn't really have to do the work. They would sail out there, sure, and stand guard, but, well, first of all, the diving bell was a recent invention, or at least an old invention reimagined. But more importantly, it wasn't Europeans actually doing the diving. Traditionally, it had been Amerindians that dove for pearls and sunken treasure, but it was almost exclusively African slaves here. Now, for them, it was probably a nightmarish hell, but for de Graaf and his crew, it was easy money. So he was working at a place called the Serenia Bank, out in the middle of the sea, about 150 miles southwest of Jamaica. It was right about halfway between Port Royal and Providence Island. He spent several weeks out there, out in the open ocean. Now, there were some English wreckers already out there, but de Graaf elected to share the space with them. France and England were, after all, old allies at this point, and the Stuarts and the Bourbons, well, they were good friends. Anyway, he had no particular orders to chase anyone else off, so he didn't do so. But when those Englishmen returned to Port Royal, they discovered that things had drastically changed. England and France were now enemies. What was left of the government in Jamaica assumed that de Graaf was on some super-secret pirate mission. David F. Marley writes, quote, The War of the League of Osberg was just then breaking out back in Europe, so that they assumed the Corsair chieftain intended greater mischief. Yet, in fact, de Graaf had departed before the full scope of hostilities had become apparent and remained blissfully unaware of the true state of affairs in his enforced isolation off the Serenia Bank. End quote. De Graaf would spend several weeks out there hauling up cannons and swivel guns, not much in the way of gold or silver, but at this moment guns were arguably more valuable than gold. When stores started to run low, though, de Graaf sent one of his ships back to Petit Guave to deliver the guns and pick up some more food and water. However, that ship didn't return. There were any number of possible reasons the ship didn't return. Contrary winds, maybe, or sunk in a storm, or waylaid at port, or captured by Biscayan privateers. 
In this case, it was the contrary winds. The ship was sitting idle, waiting for winds that would carry her southwest. But Lord Hodegraaf didn't know what the holdup was all about. His most pressing concern, though, was food. So he sailed north for the southern coast of Cuba. It was a good place to steal some much-needed supplies. Now, for a privateer flying French colors, especially someone as well-known as de Graaf, the coast of Cuba wasn't exactly the best place to pick up news. You were still in a sort of enforced isolation. It's not like you were going to sit down at tea with someone or pick up a newspaper there in the Cuban Keys. But he did eventually learn of events in October or November 1689. Now, at this point, there was a new governor in Port Royal. However, right about now, I think it's a good time to stop bothering you with the names of Jamaican governors. There will be a succession of them from here on out, but really, not a single one of them is in the least bit important to our story for the next 20 years or so. Except that they still wrote letters. In this case, the governor wrote, quote, Lorho, with a ship of 200 men, touched at Montego Bay the other day did no harm, but said that he would obtain a commission at Petit Guave and return to plunder the whole of the north side of the island. The people are so frightened that they have sent their wives and children to Port Royal. End quote. Lord Hodegraaf is warning the people of Jamaica. He let them know he would be coming. You see, France and England were at war, but this wasn't just England at war with France. Spain was at war with France as well, as was the whole of the Habsburg Empire, and the Netherlands, and Scotland, and Sweden, and a few smaller principalities, but they didn't really have much presence in the West Indies. But basically everyone was at war with France. I wonder if Lorho de Graaf considered for a moment if he were on the right side. There is a decent chance that England was still willing to have him. They'd sent enough letters to that effect in the past, and oftentimes lamented his allegiance to France. And with the Dutch Republic, which was de Graaf's home country, joining forces with England, quite literally in fact, I wonder if he thought about changing sides. The thought has crossed my mind that he might have been Catholic, but the zeal with which he and his men despoiled Spanish churches makes this unlikely. However, he did at one point have a Spanish wife, but for whatever reason, he considered France his home, or at least his adopted kingdom. When war came, and it was here now, he chose to fight for France. So he returned to Petit Guave. He gathered men and supplies, and a few of those reclaimed guns, and a commission from Governor de Cusset to attack the enemies of France in this time of war. I wonder if he saw Anne while he was there. She was likely in Cap Francais, so probably not, but if he did stop off, she would have been several months into her pregnancy. De Graaf probably knew Joseph Charel as well, but we can't really be certain. Most of those relationships are all unclear. Probably he didn't stop off at Cap Francais, though he had more important places to be. In early December, he arrived off the northern coast of Jamaica with a small armada, mostly frigates and a few sloops of war. The sea between Cuba and Jamaica was a long time favored haunt for pirates. First of all, the winds were decent, and the Cayman Trench meant that the sea was deep enough that there wouldn't be any reefs or sandbars or other hazards. But then there was the shipping. It was an excellent place to capture Spanish vessels or French vessels or English, really any nation's vessels, depending on who you were after. But what made that expanse of water so inviting was the multitude of places to disappear. They were the sort of places that you could lay traps and, when needed, hide from the authorities. For example, Montego Bay, on the northwest of Jamaica, was an excellent harbor and really lightly defended. It was where every pirate who came to Jamaica chose to lay anchor. Jan Willems, John Coxon, Jean Hamlin, everyone used it. And now... Lorho de Graaf called it home. However, he did have ships elsewhere on the coast of Jamaica. Farther to the east, there's a small bay called Runaway Bay. It's situated right now to the Green Grotto Cave System. Previously, those were called Runaway Caves. Now, the caves in the bay were used by the Arawak originally, but when England invaded Jamaica back in 1655, the Spanish fled to Runaway Bay. 
That would be a lovely story for its name, but of course that's not the case. It's called Runaway Bay and Runaway Caves because of the many escaped slaves that used it as a hideout. It was an excellent place to hide, but beyond that, it was also a place where one could secure passage to one of the escaped slave colonies on the main. See, that bay was used as a harbor for the worst sort of rapscallions, smugglers and rum runners, and fences for pirated goods used the caves. Indians and ships from those escaped slave colonies might even occasionally call there. Now, while any ship carrying good men would probably recapture those slaves, pirates, privateers, rum runners, smugglers, they were more likely to offer passage than recapture. But this was wartime. If the Spanish were going to blockade Jamaica, they would send an armada to Port Royal and park just outside the range of her guns. They would stop or sink any ships that tried to sail in and prevent any ships from leaving. But that was a large, expensive naval maneuver. It took big ships and lots of guns with even more men. But Lorho de Graaf was a pirate. He could do much the same job for far less. His ships blocked Montego Bay. Some of his sloops stayed out there in Runaway Bay and sorted out from time to time to capture any ships that passed by, any English or Spanish or Dutch ships. He spent weeks there, capturing ships and grinding trade on the north side of the island to a halt. He caught more than a dozen traders just in the first two weeks, and then his men went to shore. They burned their way across the countryside. Now, there was virtually no one there to stop them. There were no garrisons up there on the north side of the island. There were no naval detachments or fortifications. There might be, if the town was particularly large, a tower with a big gun. And, let's be honest, not a very tall tower and not a very big gun. But there wasn't even anyone to man them if there was a tower with a gun. Everybody had already left. And that was fine, really. It wasn't plunder that interested de Graaf. That was just an amusement for the men. It was the blockade. Those were his orders, and the many ships available out there for the taking. Now, if England hadn't spent the past 20 years dismantling their network of privateers, maybe they could have mounted a defense. If John Coxon and Thomas Paine and William Wright and Bartholomew Sharp and John Cook and Edward Davis and Joseph Bannister, well, if they had been kept on the back burner kept on the payroll as it was, been protected and guided rather than hunted, well, they would have been a force to be reckoned with. If England had continued handing out commissions as both France and Spain had done, they would have an armada of brethren ships to call to their defense. They would even have had Henry Morgan there for many years as lieutenant governor, who would have been the perfect liaison when dealing with buccaneers. They would also likely have had, if they were willing to hand out commissions to foreign captains, Jan Willems, Mikhail Andrezun, and Lorho de Graaf. Instead, England tried to do the honorable, righteous thing and stopped employing privateers. They hunted pirates rather than courting them. And that pushed all of those men into French service. And here, now that war is broken out, well, they're left with nothing. Well, Lord Ho de Graaf was free to assault their shores. Now, Port Royal was still in operation. They could receive ships and cargo and send it out. In fact, they were even able to receive the new governor. He would write to the Lords of Trade and Plantations, quote, On my arrival, I received news of a wreck about 40 leagues to the southwest of the island, which renders Port Royal very thin of seamen. And right here he's talking about the Spanish galleon that de Graaf had been recovering. And then he goes on, the weather has been bad, and little treasure has been recovered so far. Not that this island is likely to be a gainer, for I have no ship to send and protect those at work there. The Drake being returned a fortnight since, hardly able to float. She has since been found on survey to be irreparable for less than two thousand pounds, or more than her first cost. End quote. Remember earlier when HMS Falcon went out to capture Jan Willems and was forced to turn back? Her sails and rigging and hull were all in such poor repair. Yeah, that happened again here with the Drake. HMS Drake was actually sent out to deal with de Graaf, but couldn't even make it to the other side of the island. Now, she was a 16-gun, 6th-rate ship of the line. Not a huge warship, but a warship nonetheless. But she was almost 40 years old. 
England was sending out ships to bolster Jamaica's naval defense, but they were really sending the dregs, ships that were too rotten to sail. Really, all they were good for was sitting in port to deter that potential Spanish blockade. There was HMS Ruby, which had served England well for many years there at Jamaica, and she'd even recently been refurbished. But then she was recalled to England. Even the Falcon, though she was in too poor a condition to sail, was a 42-gun fourth-rate ship of the line. But she was recalled back to England as well. Jamaica had nothing. The new governor was at a loss. His letter continues, quote, We have therefore no ships now except the Swan, which is so bad a sailor that she is little better than nothing. If she should fall ten leagues to leeward, I never hope to see her again. The Drake was a smaller ship, but being a prime sailor, she kept the French in awe. So I must beg for a couple of prime sailors, if they be only a fifth and sixth rate, or the north side of the island will inevitably be destroyed. End quote. The governor was begging here for more ships, even the worst of the worst, as long as they could sail. It would take England a long time to realize their mistake in discouraging privateering. It would be decades, in fact, until another governor in Jamaica, Archibald Hamilton, empowered and established a group of privateers on the island. Those privateers would go on to form the Flying Gang, led by Benjamin Hornigold and Henry Jennings. That would prove to be a poor move as well. But right now, they really could have used some private mercenary seamen to aid in their defense. Lorho de Graaf was free to do as he pleased on the north side of the island, and for months he did. He and the French privateers burned and raided anywhere they pleased. But even more importantly, they controlled the shipping lanes between Cuba and Jamaica, as well as the Windward Passage just near Petit Guave. And those were pretty important sea lanes. See, Port Royal had recently risen to be the largest and most profitable slave market in the world. With things between France and Spain turning bad, and relations brightening between Spain and England, everybody was buying slaves in Port Royal, everyone but France. The Dutch sold their slaves in Port Royal, and Spain bought them, and most of that shipping traveled through either the Cayman Trench or the Windward Passage. And for the moment, Lorho de Graaf and the French controlled both. For months, until May... It was in May that de Graaf would suddenly leave his post at Jamaica. Now, it might have seemed like a miracle to the Jamaican governor, but he would soon enough find out why de Graaf left. He writes, quote, The island has fitted out a sloop, which lately went out to Caimanos for Turtle, where there were several of our craft lying. There, Lorho, the great pirate of Petit Guave, engaged the sloop, and the rest of the craft escaped. The firing was heard continuing until eleven at night, and as this was a month since, and nothing has been heard of the sloop, we conclude that Lorho has taken her, he having two men against one. End quote. Lorho de Graaf did indeed take that English sloop and incorporate it into his growing fleet, and his fleet was quickly becoming one of the more powerful naval powers in the West Indies. Well, at least in his part of the West Indies, there was still the Armada de Barlavento and the Biscayners, and over in the Lesser Antilles, everyone was gathering naval strength, but up around Cuba, Jamaica, and San Dominique, it was all Lorho de Graaf. He controlled those waters. While he was interrogating sailors, though, that he took on that turtling expedition, he found something out that was a vital piece of information. England and Spain were planning a joint operation. It was going to be a big move that involved dozens of ships, potentially thousands of men. And where they were going to attack? Well, they were going to cut off de Graaf's support at the route. England and Spain were about to march on San Dominique. Next time, Lorho de Graaf will rush back to defend his home. We'll follow him and we'll follow Anne through the rest of this war. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd also like to thank everybody who has been kind enough to help support the show, either by leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever it is you listen to the show, or anyone who has helped support us on Patreon. Without all of you, I couldn't do this, so thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. 
If you haven't checked them out yet, I certainly suggest you do so over at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can get in touch on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, or YouTube. As always, most importantly, thank you for listening.